Bokawa uh, Stephen Chen. Um, I'm going to talk about some technology trends. And we're going to very quickly go through three technology trends today. Um, so the, the first one we're going to cover is um, blockchain. Anybody, anybody try blockchain? Yeah, OK, a few people. Um, second one is chatbots. And the last one we're going to do is serverless computing. And let's see how, how we're doing on time. We will we will go through these fairly quickly, and I I, I can't promise any time for you. <laughs> Fifteen minutes is very short. <coughs> oh, and I run the um, Oracle Developer Community team, um, and also I'm the tour coordinator for all of our all of our prestigious speakers who are out here. So um, blockchain is probably best known for Bitcoin. Um, so Bitcoin is a technology for digital currency. Does anyone own some Bitcoin? Oh, oh, few. So, um, how how rich are you? How many bitcoins you own? <laughs> secret. It's a secret. Oh, oh. How about how about you, Fernando? Are you gonna share? Half half of a secret. <laughs> um, and how about our jug leader? How many how many bitcoin? <laughs> So the, the reason why these guys don't want to tell you is because if they tell you that they have five Bitcoin, <coughs> their five Bitcoin present value is worth $50,000. So you could be sitting in the room with some millionaires who are very, very rich. Maybe, maybe that's why you come out here, Fernando, right? You, s you sold some of your Bitcoin to get your ticket? <laughs> so um, Bitcoin has really taken off, but a lot of this is speculation based on it being a digital currency. Um, and you can see that the, the, it hit a peak and then it, it dropped back down again um, as people realized that it, you know, it has a slightly inflated value. And there's actually multiple cryptocurrencies. So Ethereum is another cryptocurrency as well. Um, so the real value in cryptocurrency is anonymity. Um, ability to spend across like you know different geographic borders and using it as a transaction currency between different um, real currencies but one of the disadvantages of these digital currencies is they consume a lot of resources to run because they use a peer-to-peer -peer bit um, blockchain network so this is the amount of energy consumption and terawatt hours per year that Bitcoin consumes and if you look at it in terms of households um, so in the, the equivalent in the U.S. would be 6 million U.S. households um, of energy consumption used by miners in Bitcoin. And the miners are the ones who actually provide the blockchain functionality for doing transactions. Part of the, the challenge with um, Bitcoin in particular is that the price of Bitcoin is directly proportional to the, um, the amount of energy miners are willing to consume to then get Bitcoins. Right, So if you could set up servers and you could mine for Bitcoin for less than the cost of energy and servers, then you would make a profit. Um, so as the price of Bitcoin has gone up, the number of people mining Bitcoins has gone up. Um, it means it's a very robust network, but it also means it's a very expensive network. And actually the current cost is um, the amount of Bitcoin uh, mining is equal to the energy consumption of the Czech Republic. Um, so this is how blockchain actually works. So you have a bunch of transactions going on, and all of these transactions are hashed together using a Merkle tree. And this is how you get a single hash value, which gets installed into the, um, the ledger. And then you're incrementally adding additional blocks to the Bitcoin, um, and you hash together this um, hashed value of the transactions. The previous block in the Bitcoin, so it creates a chain in the blockchain, um, a timestamp and a nonce, which is a um, you know, cryptographic unique number. And what this does is this provides a, um, a public distributed ledger for the transactions, so you can guarantee that nobody is double spending money. Um, but this technology, blockchain, is actually useful for a bunch of other applications besides digital currencies. So we've mostly been talking about using it for um, you know, public um, digital currency networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but um, it's also quite useful for private applications. 
So this is what most of the hype of blockchain is about, using it in finance, using it in other fields. And the advantage of having a private implementation of blockchain is you can um, get rid of some of the disadvantages of public um, Bitcoin and public networks. In general, there's long transaction times for digital currencies. Um, Ethereum's a little bit faster. It's um, 15 transactions per second and about 15 seconds to complete a transaction. But Bitcoin takes 10 minutes to complete a transaction and there's only seven transactions a second. And you're limited with the amount of data you can put into transactions. So the, the whole size of the entire blockchain for Bitcoin today is about 30 gigabytes. If they allowed larger data sets, then you would have bigger blockchains and it would be hard to store the whole set of network. Um, so they specifically limit the size of blockchains. In the blockchain size, you have blocks of one megabyte limit. In um, Ethereum, they have a, a gas limit for um, how large and how much computation you can do in the network to limit people doing transactions which consume too much um, CPU time. Um, if you have a public network, you can avoid this by having invitation-only network using consensus instead of peer um, reconciliation. This gives you shorter transaction times. You can do millisecond transactions, have larger data, do smart contracts, and in general, you can have more privacy to your data and your network. In a public transaction, the entire distributed ledger is public. So you may not know whose money it is because it's an anonymous um, wallet, but you know where the money is flowing. You know, how the, for the same um, people in the network, how it's been exchanging hands. Um, there's some, here are some examples of private blockchain implementations. Hyperledger Fabric is probably the most popular one. Um, and this allows you to have different pluggable implementations for how you resolve your um, um, transactions, how you do smart contracts. You can do them in Go or Java language. And um, you can do cryptocurrency as well with Hyperledger. Um, Cordova is more tailored around financial. So this specifically lets you put legal language inside of the blockchain to represent legal transactions. Um, and then it does um, transactions by consensus with notary nodes. And the last one is Ethereum, which has a, um, a private enterprise version as well. Um, and this does ledger level mining proof of work, just like in the public networks. And, but it also supports smart contracts in its own custom language called Solidity. And it has, of course, has a built-in cryptocurrency because it starts from a cryptocurrency. Um, so the, we're actually releasing a Oracle Cloud um, blockchain service, and it's going to be based on Hyperledger. Um, I think IBM's public um, blockchain is also based on Hyperledger, um, Amazon as well, I think. So most of the public, the private implementations are based on Hyperledger and clouds. And here are some of the use cases where you can use blockchain. So is anyone in financial services? They work for a bank or other financial company? Okay. Well, if you were, you know, you can use it for financial ledgers, trading, payment processing, global transactions. Does anyone do legal contracts for their programming? Programming legal contracts? Okay. Smart contracts are good for this. How about medical and healthcare? Does anyone work for a, a hospital, medical company? No? Okay. And last one is IoT. You can use it for, like, you know, smart transactions between devices. Does anyone do IoT for their company? Ah, oh, we have our first person. Okay. So... The, the takeaway from this is for the gentleman in the back of the room, you now know some information about blockchain you can use for your work. For everyone else, you can ignore blockchain. When your colleagues say, this is this cool technology, you know, learn about blockchain, you tell them, I, I know about blockchain, tell them a little bit about it, and we don't need it. And um, actually, you can just use a database. So for 99% for of the use cases, standard relational or big data databases with transactions work quite well. You don't actually need a distributed ledger. Okay, so that was blockchain. Um, next, chatbots. So chatbots are also a very cool trending technology. Here's our, our little friends. And um, you probably have seen applications of chatbot for home use, like um, Google Assistant or Alexa or um, the new HomePod from Apple. Um, so these are all examples of, you know, using text-to-speech, having applications or skills which you can expose to end users, and mostly a consumer use case. But what about doing the reverse of a chatbot? So instead of having the chatbot talk to people, 
how about having the um, the, P, the the chat bot actually initiate the conversation? So this is a snippet from the um, Google I/O presentation a few days ago, where they announced um, Google Duplex. So on the left here is a chat bot. And the, the right is a real person. Okay, so a little bit creepy. <laughs> um, as you can see, they intentionally put in um, like small pauses mm -hmm, and like little colloquial things. So the chatbot feels more like a human. And um, one of the problems with this, if you notice, the chatbot never said that it was a robot. Um, so there's a small ethical issue with having computers impersonate people, so Google's going to fix that with the final version. Um, so maybe we don't need chatbots. Maybe the chatbots are the ones talking to us instead. Um, the typical case for like chatbots is like you'd be ordering things or doing services or doing things online, right? But you can do that on your computer and you can have Google Assistant talk to those people for you. Um, more typical example of, I think, in an enterprise case for chatbots is actually doing something with um, text-based chatbots. Um, so, for example, um, using like um, Facebook or WeChat or Slack or Line. Some of the folks who we presented to in um, was it uh, Fukuoka, I think. Um, they're actually some of the developers in Fukuoka were using Line and developing chatbots for their company. Um, so I think this is a more common use case. And um, so we also have a chatbot service, which is currently released for Oracle Cloud. And it supports um, the different messengers and also the home-based devices for building chatbots. And basically, the way you build chatbots from a programming standpoint is it's all about creating sets of rules um, and pattern matching for your chatbots. Um, and so in the UI, you can set up some um, different um, test lines, and it gives you a confidence factor for which of the routines will be executed based on pattern matching. So this is an example with you know, buying and selling cars. Um, and then you can put in different patterns for how it will match against the text that comes in. So it automatically does all the text-to-speech translation, um, has algorithms for determining what the user might be saying, and then you can create a flow of different interactions where you execute routines based on what the person is trying to, to, to do with you. Um, so it's a, it's a good application to kind of augment what you might be doing. Um, but I think a lot of the chatbot technology is kind of a bridge to end consumers. If you're dealing with business users or if you're dealing with enterprise use cases, it's not as useful. OK, and last one we're going to chat about is um, serverless technology. Um, so serverless technology, you can see here, these are all the, the servers which didn't survive. Um, so even though we talk about serverless, serverless is not actually about getting rid of servers. It's about paying for just the time which you're going to use on the servers. So rather than provisioning servers up front and creating a bunch of capacity for your applications, what you do instead is you create functions. And those functions only um, execute when requests come in. So when you get a request into your function, it will spin up uh, an instance to run your function. It will you know, keep that alive for a while to um, handle requests. Um, if there's more requests than a single node can handle, it'll spin up more servers to process it, po possibly in different geographies, so you get um, global distribution. And then when you stop getting requests, then you don't pay for resources. 
So sounds good, right? You only pay for the time you use. You don't have to provision servers up front. So here are some of the advantages of serverless. You only pay by the server time you use, right? You can use more of a micro function architecture, so even smaller units than microservices. You get automatic scaling in cloud services, so as your workload goes up, you automatically get more um, um, capacity. And then finally, you can take advantage of really low latency on a distributed cloud. So if you have a global customer audience, you'll get servers spun up that are geographically close to where the requests are coming in. Um, and this is the ideal. The, the biggest, really, factor for people doing serverless is money. And um, ideally, you, you see this line here with serverless. And on the horizontal axis is scale. The vertical one is cost. So all of this green stuff here is money that you're saving because you didn't have to buy servers up front. So this, this looks good, right? Well, in reality, it's more like this. <laughs> so um, the, the line here for serverless um, in most cloud provider implementations, they charge a premium for using serverless, where if you provisioned the same servers on you know, Amazon or Oracle Cloud or your favorite cloud service up front, you, and you ran the same serverless infrastructure on that, you'd actually have lower costs at high scale. So at low scale, you win, right? Because you, you don't have to pay for a whole server. But then as you scale up, typically the ser you pay a premium for serverless costs. You get the other benefits, possibly not the cost savings. And you have to calculate this for your use case, right? So it, it varies based on the provider, but there's a lot of hidden fees. One is the general you know, cost per transactions in serverless. Another one is they often charge you for API calls. So when you get a request in, you have to set up an API gateway. The API gateway will take the HTTP request, transfer that to a, like a function, and you're paying for both the functions and the API gateway. Um, and typically, API gateways are much more expensive than the serverless. Um, so there's some proprietary serverless frameworks, so Amazon Lambdas, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure. And the disadvantage of these is once you buy into these, this model, you're kind of trapped because you, you're running against their proprietary implementation of a serverless model. You can't go between different cloud providers, and you can't run the application yourself locally. Um, r more recently, there have been a bunch of open source serverless frameworks. And so all of these, um, the FN project, which is an Oracle project, OpenWhisk, which is um, Apache and also um, sponsored by IBM. OpenFaz is another open source serverless. And the, the last one is here is Kubeless. Um, so all of these are completely open source. You can run this on your local machine. You can run it on any cloud provider. And the advantage of this is that when you're using a, an open source serverless framework, you're not locked into a specific provider. And you have the option of either running serverless on a like a managed implementation where they take care of the instances for you or you can set it up yourself with your own servers so buy your server capacity run it yourself so ideally with a scenario like this you can kind of cheat so i'm calling this own serverless so at the bottom here um, we we just run on managed infrastructure when you hit a large enough scale where you actually are getting cost savings from provisioning servers you can provision your own servers and run your own serverless architecture and get kind of the best of both worlds um, from a cost saving standpoint. So this is possible with open source serverless architectures, not if you're on a proprietary serverless architecture. OK, so hopefully you learned a little bit about this. For more information, we have a site, developer.oracle.com, which talks about um, different trending technologies. And we also run an event series called Oracle Code. Um, so this year, Java 1 in San Francisco is being um, rebranded to Oracle Code 1. It includes all the same content as Java 1. So we have three dedicated Java tracks, five shared technology tracks, and then three new tech tracks of new technology. And the call for papers is still open. So if you want to submit um, till this Thursday, you can still submit papers. Um, so thank you guys very much, and I hope you Enjoyed the talks today. Arigatou gozaimasu.